Dear guests, uh, we have a couple of people here in the auditorium, but I think several of you were reached by the message that we had limited capacity here. So most of you are going to be with us online today. Uh, it's my real pleasure and privilege to welcome Eric Perla back to site in the Stockholm School of Economics. Um, as many of you know, that Eric was the director of site for many, many years before many years. wandering off to EBRD, and he is now the chief economist of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. I have to look at my note because I always mix up if infrastructure investment comes yeah. first, but you know, I'm, I'm learning slowly. I do it. Yes, and uh, the topic of today's discussion is going to be sustaining global value chains, uh, a topic that none of us uh, in the field of economics could have missed that this is important and one of the foundations of how modern societies operate today. Uh, I'm, I'm also very happy to say that this is a, a joint seminar together with VISOM, uh, the Center for Asian Studies, uh, SCE, and the Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center. Um, so again, warmly welcome, uh, warmly welcome to Eric, and uh, without any further ado, as we say, please Eric, the floor is yours. Well, wonderful to be back, and uh, so we have a little echo here because it's not enough people in the room, but uh, I understand there are quite a few on, on the, uh, virtually participating. So uh, obviously, you know, I passed through Sweden and I couldn't avoid coming back to the site of the, the, um, the place of the crimes from the past. But it's, uh, it's been, uh, I've said this before, but it's um, you know, one thing I've learned in life is it's very good to, it's very important to get a good successor. And uh, I had a very good, or I have a very good successor here and uh, has uh, taken site to, to new, new levels. And that's very, um, very encouraging for, for me. So, so um, as Kruger was saying, the global value chains have become really central to our understanding of the global economy. So, particularly now during the pandemic, because in the early phase of the pandemic, we had to all be you know, economists and epidemiologists, and, and we had to spend a lot of time trying to understand uh, the impact of social distancing and, and, and uh, you know, new variants of the virus and all things. Now we have to become specialists on value chains, and, and these are very specific uh, value chains in each uh, industry, and, and you know there are corporate-specific uh, uh, arrangements. So uh, it's it's very challenging to, to try to understand the global economy at this point. So uh, and and of course the global value chains are very much on people's minds because you see a lot of of these. Um, Expressions of the problems in the global value chains with you know the long delays, the, the incredible increase in shipping costs, the the, um, the the issues of empty containers going one direction and then not enough containers going in the other direction. All those things are very much on the top of people's minds, and when people try to look at, for example, what kind of inflation are we going to have uh, going forward, uh, they start by looking at. So, so um, when we sat down, and, and this is the first uh, major report that I have been in since I came to the AIB, and um, the, the origin of this report was very much to understand the impact of the pandemic and uh, trying to understand you know, how are these value chains, uh, how resilient were they to the pandemic, and uh, how. Uh, what kind of changes will the pandemic lead to in terms of how these global value chain operate? So I'm going to talk you through this and, and, and try to show you that indeed these global value chains have been affected by the pandemic, but the challenges they are facing going forward are even greater and they're particularly tied to the uh, need to decarbonize these global value chains. So that's going to be very much the the focus of, of um, or the at least the end of, of this presentation is going to deal with that with that issue. So, so just um, if I can get this 
to work? Would you, should I use this one? Maybe okay. So so um, yeah, I mean everyone I think is very familiar with the global value chains, but what is um, absolutely key to global value chains is of course this fragmentation of of um, production uh, uh, across different stages of, of the value chain before it becomes a, 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 a final product. And um, you can see this is a bicycle. This image is actually taken from uh, the World Bank's uh, World Development Report from 2020. And it shows you that the different components you know, come from different parts of the world and, and are assembled in, 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 you know, in, in, in some other place. And, and you know, the, the great thing with these global value chains is that they really have opened up opportunities for countries that never had a chance to join these global uh, value chains in the sense that, you know, don't, you don't have to produce a whole car or even a whole bicycle. You just have to produce maybe, you know, a brake or, or a, uh, you know, for a car, a windshield wiper or whatever. And then you can uh, integrate into these uh, global value chains and maybe start building uh, on on that foothold uh, that you get, so this has become an extremely important uh, lever of, of development, and that's of course also why we want to understand how they are affected by the various uh, challenges that, that they are exposed to, and, and what's what's going to happen to them in, in the long term. So so um, so they indeed they have created you know, new pathways for many emerging economies, and. You won't be surprised, given that I now work for an infrastructure bank, that I was particularly interested in this connection between these uh, value chains and, um, and the infrastructure. And of course, you can see it's sort of obvious that they depend on, on infrastructure in the sense that you know, they are, these are goods that are shipped you know, across uh, the world, uh, you know, many long distances, and sometimes uh, you know, back and forth. Uh, I understand that the average part uh, component of, uh, of the Nissan's um, uh, car production in, in UK, each component goes on average seven times across uh, the, the, the channel. And uh, so it's, you know, an incredibly complex uh, process to, to um, manufacture uh, things through these global value chains. And, and of course, infrastructure matters. And exactly infrastructure that allows you to to uh, do this fragmentation, to separate uh, this, the, the different stages. So it's obvious in that direction, but also what's key is that um, you know, these global value chains are driving infrastructure development and, and they are pushing countries to, to establish uh, better infrastructure. And, and of course, uh, that mutually reinforcing process, it can be very helpful for countries that are trying to, to engage in, in global production. So, so when we look over a longer period of time, these global value chains have, they, they grew incredibly quickly in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s. And then after the global financial crisis, there's been this perception that they kind of stagnated, that they actually stagnated as a share of, of total exports. So these, they're about 50% of total exports. And, and so, so it looks like these, the, the um, increasing production for this value chain uh, had sort of been halted. But actually, when you start looking a bit more carefully, uh, what you see is that, first of all, they have followed the, um, the increase in overall, overall uh, total exports. So, so that's uh, has, and total export, particularly in, in, before the, in the years before the pandemic, uh, increased uh, very rapidly. So it, they have increased in absolute value. But what's even more important is that the, the, the fundamental shift, and I'll show you some image later on to, 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 to illustrate this. Um, the shift has been from advanced to emerging economies. For, to, for, so for emerging economies, they have become even more important uh, than they were before. So that is sort of the starting point of, of, of this uh, presentation. And so, so, so they are very important levers for development, but they're facing a number of, of uh, shocks. So, or potential challenges. Um, so you have, of course, the pandemic shock, which sort of triggered our interest in these global value chains. And, and you have, on the one hand, you had the initial uh, shutdown of the Chinese economy, given China's importance in these global value chains. That, um, that shock uh, was 
you know, it was obvious to have an impact, but what is truly remarkable is how quickly the, these uh, value chains uh, recovered in China. And it says something about how the Chinese economy works and also particularly how the logistics in, in China work, that they were able to, to, uh, to recover so quickly. What has happened since is, of course, created in, in, in additional challenges because you had sort of reopening and closing of, of economies uh, around the world at different uh, times and to a different extent. And, and that has been a challenge to deal with for these global value chains. But actually, the, the, the major challenge, and this is something that I hadn't fully taken in before starting to look at it uh, more closely, is that the volumes that have to go through these global value chains have expanded enormously because of uh, the stimulus. And uh, so the real challenge, and I would say almost all the, challenge, the, the problems that we're seeing in global value chains now come from that enormous increase, particularly in, in, in demand for manufactured goods. And so we are, you read a lot, for example, about the shortage of semiconductors. We are producing and, and selling more semiconductors than ever. And, and uh, you know, the, we read about the long waiting lines to, to, to get a, a car and so on, but we're actually selling more cars than we ever had. But it's this very uh, dramatic uh, increase in, in the demand that has created this problem. So you can say, yes, it's a, it's a weakness that these su supply chains have not responded more quickly, but it's also you know, extraordinary what they have uh, had had to, to deal with. So you have that challenge, and, and maybe we can come back to that in the discussion. They, you have the trade tensions, so this whole idea that particularly in the high-tech goods you know, and, and, and decoupling and, and, and those things that started before the pandemic but has sort of been accentuated particularly by, you know, by the tension between US and, and China in particular. Um, again, we don't see a lot of evidence yet. It doesn't mean that it cannot happen in the future, but we don't see a lot of evidence of all those trade tensions really affecting fundamentally, other than some very specific sectors, but overall volumes are not so much affected by this. And then you have technological change because of course, digital infrastructure you know, really changes everything. And, and these global value chains are very much about transfer, is increasingly about services, but even more so about transfer of information. So it's about uh, transferring very, very granular, very detailed, often very sensitive information across you know, many stages of, of this um, uh, supply chain. And, and, and the lead firms of these um, supply chains are really, I mean, their strength is that they can standardize and, and, uh, and uh, you know, implement uh, these uh, information flows and, and make sure that these inf information flows happen. And, and the information flows, are very much about, um, you know, they're about trust relationships. If you're gonna e transfer this kind of very sensitive information, uh, this trust uh, that has built up in these uh, value chains over time. And, and trade economists, that they, when they look at these um, arrangements, they, they talk about the, the relationship specific nature of these um, uh, uh, supply chains. And, and so it's a very different form of trade than, than uh, other, other types of trade. And some of this resilience and the kind of uh, ability to resist shocks and, and, and not uh, change too much comes from it's, that it's very hard to break these relationship specific uh, uh, investments. And, and uh, you, you also this, you, you would think it's very easy just to have multiple suppliers or, or or um, you know, build buffers to deal with, with um, future shocks. First of all, that's typically very costly, but it's also very hard because these are, as I said, relationship-specific investments. So, so these are three you know, very fundamental challenges. But I would say the, the, the fourth, and, and in our view, the sort of dominant and, and the one that will be the real test for these arrangements is the, the net zero transition. And the... As, as I said, you know, the, the, these goods are shipped across very long distances, but they also involve production in many different places and very different conditions. And, and, and that, uh, getting control over that, particularly from these, for these uh, 
GVC lead firms is going to be a, a enormous challenge, but also a, a very interesting opportunity. And I'll come back to that at the end because we don't have many mechanisms for enforcing um, decarbonization across borders and across sectors. And that's what very much um, these GVCs have, can do. So, so um, very quickly on, on the um, pandemic shocks, I said you know, these, uh, these pandemic shocks continue, but, but actually, you know, when you look at the volumes that go through these global value chains are, are, uh, are very significant. Yes, there are bottlenecks, but they, again, they reflect more the, the very high uh, vo volumes that are going through them. They are, and I, I, you know, there will be changes, but I think it's, they might not be as dramatic as we, we, um, we sort of thought from the, from the beginning. And, and this is to a considerable extent due to these um, relationship specific um, uh, arrangement. And, 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 you know, in long term, it's going to be those things that drive uh, these, um, these, uh, the structure of these relationships. And, and you know, th this sort of hyper efficiency that you see in this global value chain, it's going to be very hard to reverse that. I mean, it's, 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 a, you know, it's been a, an incredible. Um, contribution in terms of productivity in, in global production. So, so, um, so if you now are, are a country that you know, want to attract this kind of infrastructure investment, you, 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 um, you uh, need to think about what strategy am I going to use to, to do this. So, so, so as I said, here is a, here's a picture of the participation uh, uh, in global value chain. So this is a share of total exports that go through this global value chain. So, you can see uh, the top line there is advanced economy. So it has really come down you know, quite significantly. Then you see that emerging economies have increased, uh, and it, but it's not only about China. Uh, many countries, particularly in, in, in Asia, so Southeast Asia, maybe in particular, have also increased uh, their participation. So it's really you know, a changing world. Democracies are emerging. Countries have also taken a larger share of, of global output, but but this uh, participation has, has been particularly stark. And, and still, they are not, have not caught up with advanced economies. So there's still you know, a lot of room for further um, participation. You can see there's also quite a bit of difference across different economies. But China is actually below uh, the average. To, to some extent, that has to do with the size of the Chinese economy. But it also suggests that, that there is, even in China, which has you know, such a formidable presence in these global value chains, even for them, there is an opportunity to, uh, to uh, increase participation. So, so that's about you know, the total uh, level of, of participation. And, but what's quite important is, you know, where are you in, in, as a country in these global value chains? In, in, you know, where, and, and these value chains are, have a range of activities, everything from, uh, you know, research and development to marketing, and, and you need to think about, uh, you know, where do you want to go from here? And it's not obvious. So, so China has progressed by upgrading and, um, and uh, taking more and more of its uh, uh, meat intermediate goods, finished goods. Uh, China, China is now producing them uh, themselves. And that's been uh, basically the, the, the story of China and, and how China has managed to increase productivity uh, in its economy. If you look at India, it has a, had a very different approach, it focused on very specific activities and specific parts and also specific, uh, as I will show you later, specific states in, in, in India and using um, uh, particularly uh, uh, high-tech, high uh, solutions to, to get more out of these um, uh, uh, activities in the global value chain. So there's nothing inherently good or bad with moving upstream or moving downstream. What, what, what is important is how much can you improve productivity at, in different activities at different stages of, of, uh, of the, um, the value chain. And, you know, when you think about this, you, and you think about what kind of infrastructure do I need, you need to kind of decide what, what, what kind of a, uh, you know, where do we want to go from here in terms of, of GVC? And of course, you know, how much investment do you want to make in, in transport? How much in, on the uh, in, you know, 
in energy or how, you know, our R and D um, and, and so on. How much we, we want to digitalize? All those things are, are related to to, to um, uh, decisions that you you come from an analysis of, of where you are in this in terms of, of that space. So so a few things that stand out when you try to understand the connection between infrastructure and uh, and uh, global value chain uh, participation. One is that it seems, and that's the, the left hand graph here, which describes the connection between sort of overall infrastructure score, the quality of infrastructure and the global value chain participation is that you need a certain level. So you need a certain level of, of uh, power so, or, or, or um, energy uh, port. You need a certain level of, uh, of transport and to participate at all. But as you increase, as your infrastructure improves, you can also uh, increase uh, your value chain participation. Of course, you should be careful here about, it's a correlation, so it's not necessarily causality, and, and there could be other things behind uh, that explain this very strong correlation between infrastructure quality and, and, uh, and the particip participation in global value chain. So another thing that stands out is that uh, the more sophisticated goods, the more uh, with uh, higher technology components, those goods uh, have required more uh, a higher quality of, of, of uh, infrastructure. So this is um, things you have to, to think about when you are uh, trying to figure out what kind of infrastructure investments to make. So, so as I said, you know, what are you going to do? It's going to be influenced by where do you want to be in, in, in terms of, of uh, different activities. So there are all these pre-production activities, design, research, development, and brand building. And, uh, and of course, infrastructure can be very effective in, in facilitating face-to-face. -face. If, if these are very relationship uh, intense uh, um, arrangements, you need this face-to-face -face, uh, interaction is, is very important. And then you can engage in sort of post-production activities and, and uh, you know, after sales service and marketing and so on. And of course, again, you know, ICT is very important for you to engage with, with, with uh, customers and improving logistics. And, and here already you can see for emerging and developing countries, you know, the, the quality of, of the digital infrastructure that you have available differs a lot across countries, but also differs a lot within countries. So this we talk about this digital divide will be something uh, very important to understand and also to try to address as you uh, want to participate in these um, uh, value chains. Otherwise you, you could really reinforce uh, inequality within countries. So thinking about how can we in, in this particular country uh, uh, address this. And, and uh, you, you can also see uh, the, the graph to the right that looks at the internet penetration and export to GDP, you see a pretty strong uh, correlation. Again, be careful, it's a correlation, but, but um, it, it's, 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 it's um, quite striking. So, so those are the things you have to think about, and then you, you, you are sort of looking at, at, um, at, we looked at some cases, we looked at China. China is you know, probably the most dramatic change in, in uh, global value chains over the last 10 years have been China's increasing share of, of intermediate goods. And that has really changed uh, the world economy. It's important to try to understand what, what really happened in China. So the China, of course, has become a very important uh, hub in, in these global value chains. And, and you, to the right here, you can see both in terms of its the forward linkages and the backward linkages, the, uh, the role of, of high tech high technology has, has really increased quite uh, significantly. And, and that, of course, in, in turn has helped China increase productivity uh, very significantly. You can also see, here, here we're looking at uh, the, the share of, of high tech um, in exports in different parts of the country. So for those of you who follow China, has, you know, this has been sort of a perennial challenge for China to develop its interior. and then. Many um, you know, big programs have been launched. You can maybe argue that even the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, was ultimately driven by this need to try to engage, uh, or at least initially, uh, to engage 
the interior of China. And here you can see, maybe it's not so clear, but you can see for sure that some uh, interior uh, provinces, so Sichuan, for example, Chongqing, which has a sort of independent status, has, uh, has really benefited from this. And actually, when we looked at it, it's, it really coincides very strongly with uh, the uh, completion of, of this Europe, uh, China Europe uh, railway. So today, a lot of goods um, from, this kind of, from uh, the interior of China are shipped on, on rail. And actually, even a lot of Japanese and Korean exports now go through China. So they go to uh, Qingdao or, or Tianjin and, and are then shipped uh, uh, to uh, go on rail uh, through, um, from China to Europe. So these are really very fundamental changes that were driven by uh, infrastructure development. And here you can see also that, you know, what's going on in the Chinese economy, you know, very rapid uh, increase of, of use of robots and, and um, also a very strong investment. And, and particularly in these parts that I mentioned, Chongqing and, and you see Shangsha is another place that has become sort of a high-tech center, you know, a lot of investment in digital, in the digital future. Sorry. So, we, we also had a chapter on India to try to understand uh, the difference. And I actually had a pleasure presenting this uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in Delhi, also virtually, unfortunately, but it was really interesting to see how, how central this um, aspiration is to, to, Chinese, uh, to Indian policymakers to, to try to understand how can we improve our infrastructure? How can we engage more in, in these global value chains? So, so to the left here, you have um, participation in, in, so in total exports and DVC exports and non-DVC exports. And so, so India has managed to increase its, its uh, exports very significantly, but you can see that DVC exports really uh, are lagging um, behind. And, uh, and India is still you know, a very small player by international standards. And you know, a lot of the efforts of the current government is about you know, changing this. And, and as I said, you know, in India, the, the, the focus is very much on a few states. So Maharashtra, Gujarat, and, and a few uh, uh, states have, have been able to engage very actively in, in, uh, in global uh, value chains. And you can also see the connection to uh, transport connectivity that a place like Gujarat has you know, extremely good uh, transport connectivity, but also, also been quite successful. So there is a, a link there between infrastructure investment, and in this case, transport. And, and we also did uh, kind of an interesting exercise uh, to, to look at uh, ports in India, and we developed, we calculated what we call isochrones, you know, so how long does it take, how, long, how far do you get in two hours from the port, uh, and, and, and how far do you get in, in four hours? And you can see that you don't get very far towards the interior, and, and when we looked at, at this and, and tried to understand how much was exported, it was clear there was sort of a cutoff almost uh, between four hours and six hours. So if you are more than four hours away, it's very hard to engage in exports and engage in, in global value chains in general. So then these isochrones and, and improve um, uh, the connectivity. We actually, in this, just a side point, we are actually now uh, developing uh, a a tool to understand connectivity investments uh, much better. There's a methodology that um, EU has developed that we are now applying that methodology across um, Asia and starting with India. And it's, it's going to be, a, it's a very, in general, this geospatial analysis is super interesting. A lot is happening and, and I'm investing a lot in this uh, at the moment because we think that this can really help us both understand you know, different policy options, you know, when you want to build transport infrastructure, how, how should you do it? What are the, the different implications? But also understanding impact once you have made this investment, you know, what happened to connectivity from, from investment. So, so um, you know, you, if you're a policymaker in a, in a developing or emerging economy, you have to think about 
course, it's, it's a sort of broader industrial policy, but there are some specific issues that you have to think about when it comes to, to, to global value chains. So, so you can have policies that are you know, specifically trying to address the, the um, global value chain challenge, or you can have policies that are sort of more neutral. So, so here, special economic zones are typically uh, really targeting uh, engagement with the global value chains. So that would be an example of what I call a place-based or a, a, um, you know, a policy that is focusing on a specific geographic location. And then you have what you call place neutral that are not uh, really uh, focused on, on place, but looks at the whole the country as a whole. So you have at one end the special economic zones and things like um, investment promotion agencies have become actually, there's a lot of uh, very interesting academic research on, on the role of these and, and, and actually they're showing that they have very significant impact. But then you, at the other extreme, you have a sort of GDC neutral and, and place neutral uh, policies that are you know, like institutional quality, business environment, and, and, and sort of broader soft infrastructure. So this is just to provide a little bit of a framework for, for a policymaker to try to start uh, thinking through this, this issue. So, so and, and then from this comes you know, a number of, of different policy options, and, and you can, can think about you know, what are you going to do as a country. So, so let me end with a few remarks around uh, this net zero transition. Uh, which is you know, the next frontier, not only for these countries, but for the world as a whole. And what is the role of GVCs in this? Well, there are things that matter here. Are, you know, how can you decarbonize your energy supply? So that's about renewable energy production. It's about renewable energy trade. And then you have, you know, how do you decarbonize your, your transport, your logistics? And, and, um, and then, of course, you know, you need to participate in, in international governance. We had Glasgow uh, right now. We have um, you know, another COP27 coming up uh, in Egypt uh, uh, next year. And, and, but then you have also this, what we have tried to call the green comparative advantage. How can you exploit uh, these opportunities for decarbonization to, to try to attract um, uh, GVC investment? So, there are two components here. One is, of course, the lead firms in these uh, DVCs. You know, they can do things that you know, it's very difficult for governments to do. They can impose carbon price internally. You know, this is, these are really governance arrangements, and, and they rely on this ability to impose standards, you know, internal pricing, and so on. They can, so common standards, they can put a lot of effort, emphasis, and this will be increasingly important to to provide uh, transparency to, to this, uh, you know, to, to your carbon footprint. And, and uh, you know, a lot of what's happening now in this sort of transition strategies is, is around creating transparency and, and, and using that in, in, in the financial sector. So central banks are pushing down um, uh, policies to identify climate risk in financial institutions' portfolios. And, and then the financial institutions in, in turn are supposed to look at their their borrowers and, and so on. And that relies a lot on, on transparency. So that's one side. So what, and, and as I said, this is a really a very interesting uh, tool, both for development, as I emphasized, but also for um, achieving uh, the net zero transition. And the other side of this is, of course, that now countries that are, want to attract this GVC investment and, and you know, they can, uh, Use uh, investment in, in green infrastructure to to uh, to do that. And and uh, I was speaking the other day to to uh, like twenty five finance ministers in the Arab world, and and of course they have for years tried to to uh, attract this kind of GV for decades tried to uh, attract EVC investment. But you know many of them have now very ample resources of of. Uh, of green power, so solar, but also uh, wind. And uh, this can be an opportunity for, for many countries to, to uh, join or to, uh, to increase their participation in global value chains because by offering decarbonization opportunities, you can also see that gonna be competition among countries to, to try to offer more attractive uh, opportunities in, in this regard. And, and it may also go into other things like biodiversity and so on. 
So, so let me summarize. So, so I spoke, you know, a lot about GVCs as as um, levers of, of of development, and um, but in particular, I would emphasize this uh, levers for climate smart development because you know a lot of people, and not least in Sweden, you know, a lot of companies are very focused on on. Uh, Achieving uh, net zero, make commitments to, to being net zero by whatever 2050 or 2040 or so on, so on. And and I think people have not thought about this or not connected that to to the uh, development dimension, and, and that this can really become a very important lever for getting uh, a climate transition going in countries that you know are facing a lot of challenges in terms of of um, Investment and, and ending up uh, uh, left behind as we as we try to move towards net zero. So um, and 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 as I said, these countries or, or we we haven't we don't have any mechanisms to achieve this across borders. We really rely a lot on on sort of peer pressure. So the you know the Paris Agreement and the this, the Glasgow Com Climate Pact, as it's now called relies almost exclusively on, on, on these peer pressures and the fact that governments will sort of start submitting their NDCs and then these will be assessed by by, uh, by other governments and that somehow is going to force us. And we saw some uh, effect of that peer pressure leading up to Glasgow, but there are also very, a lot of limits now to how you really actually going to translate this to actual action on the ground. It's, it's, it's going to be a huge, um, a huge challenge. And here, I think these GVCs and the GVC lead firms are going to be potentially very important in, in getting there. So, um, and, and of course, finally, and, with, and this is, I wouldn't say that this is, is less important. Uh, the, you know, we are going into a period of a lot of distrust, a lot of um, um, tension in, in the global system, having these, um, Links uh, through the global value chains and, and the common stakes and, and in, in the common prosperity uh, is going to be very important. So I, I think that's another reason why we should be very um, pay a lot of attention to what happens in, in the global value chain. So let me stop here and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you, Rick. Uh, very interesting. And, and of course, I know that we have already questions from the people that are not here, but online. Yes. And I'll try to be fair in distributing sort of the question and answer time to those. There should be mind. some incentive for exactly, coming Exactly, exactly. So I agree with that. So uh, since I'm the host and I'm holding the mic, I'm yeah. going to start out with a couple of things yeah. and then I'll read up on, on the questions here. But yeah. I just wanted, as an old IMF macro person, yeah. you know, to, to have one one minute reflection on how how regular sort of mechanisms of, of competitiveness across countries would affect what, what we see here, which is more sort of the micro part, if you want. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking now particularly about sort of tapering dealing with inflation. It's going to affect exchange rates. We know that in the past, when, when the US Fed is hiking rates, it has serious implications for emerging countries. I mean, are macro factors like that? That is a little bit in the curve. So I think there are two parts to the answer. One is the that many of your former colleagues at the IMF were spending a lot of time trying to understand what's happening in this global value chain because they are trying to understand these price rises that we're seeing now, uh, they, uh, so, 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 uh, so your, your former colleagues, they're really becoming experts in this, and I, I, I talk to them quite a lot uh, these days. And, and uh, so, 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 so clearly there is something here that we need to understand that it has links to, to macro policy and, and, so, 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 and, and you're trying to understand these price rises, and, and what you see is that every sector looks quite different, and there are different explanations. And, and when you look at each um, sector, 
look, this cannot continue. This is not, this is not uh, sort of an equilibrium, as you would call it. You know, this is going to go over either in the first half of next year or towards the end of next year. And then, and, and you know, it's one in automotive, automobiles, it's about semiconductors a lot. And, and you know, you, 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 have, you go through sector by sector and, and there are different explanations. But then you think about, so, so now you have these price effects going on in many different sectors at, at the same time. And, and then they're going to spread over time because they are, um, you know, they, they're going to add. So, so what seems like very temporary may become, have the effect on permanent because it, it affects many uh, sectors of the economy and, and over a longer extended period of time. So that's the first, you know, so it's important to understand. The, the, the other part that you, you, you mentioned, you know, the vulnerability to, to macro shocks, I think it's also a very real concern. I mean, the good news there is that um, it seems that countries ha are much better prepared today for, for those kind of uh, uh, shocks, particularly those related to, you, know, you mentioned the taper tantrum, you know, these uh, changes in, in those systemically important uh, countries, particularly in the, in the US, but also Europe and play some role and and, and that um, you know there's an awareness both on the side of of the countries that were so vulnerable to this and, and we saw some of early early march 2020 you know, there was this big shock to the system and we had outflows they haven't even seen during the, the global financial crisis but the system actually recovered very quickly and, and these um, outflows became inflows and and, and actually after a year don't see uh, you know, a lot of, of impact of that. And I think that reflects on the one hand, you know, very improved, uh, much improved frameworks in, in these countries for how to deal with this, the, the, the kind of original sin of, of borrowing in, in foreign currency. Governments don't really do that in the emerging world any longer. The, the problem is that the private sector does it. So that's what created the vulnerability uh, in, in, the, in early 2020. But the other thing is also that Partly because these economies that are affected are more important for the world economy. So the US, for example, or the, the Federal Reserve is much more careful in how they communicate around this. If you, you, you hear you know, the statements they're making, you know, how long you know, we're first going to start reducing our, our buying, and then we're going to maybe sometime next year, uh, you start looking at, at the interest rate hikes. That's very different from how it was at the paper tantrum when everything was announced almost. Uh, without any preparation and, and, and countries really struggle. So the vulnerabilities are there for sure, and we need to think about them when we think about global value chain. But I think the good news is that they are maybe a bit less than they were, were before. I mean, if I, I can follow up a little bit on the macro factors, obviously energy prices, yeah. uh, that's gone, you know, skyrocketing prices. And, and you're talking here about sort of the green transition and 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 so on but that's going to take several years to be a reality and, and balance what we see now so how should we think about how that's going to influence these global value chains in the meantime so as obviously energy is going to be important and it is important and, and these increases but as you say they, these are not really related to that net zero transition. even in china we, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the energy cuts there and so on, but they are not, they're related to, to some of the plan uh, uh, targets, which are mostly based on what we call energy intensity, so the share of energy in, in GDP, but that's very different from trying to target carbon uh, footprints. And, and, and so I think this impact is, is still sometime into the future, but it's, we should expect energy to become more expensive. I mean, it should, if we, you know, if, if we are, or, or carbon-based energy, so, so energy uh, that relies on, on, on oil and, and coal, and coal in particular, that has to become more expensive. Otherwise, we will not succeed in, in this transition. So I think if we look a little bit further into the future, that, those energy costs are going to affect global value chains as well. And that's what, of course, what gives the incentive to do these, um, this uh, decarbonization. In the, in the global value chain. All right, before I let in the audience here, I'm going to be fair to the yes. audience online and, and see if I can 
can read uh, one of the questions here. Um, uh, so, Eric, could you please share your thoughts about two aspects of global value chains and infrastructure developments going forward? What is your view on the concept of re-offshoring? I guess onshoring would be the shorter version of that. Uh, and then the second is implications of the special case of greenflation, upward price pressure on goods produced in Asia, etc. Yeah, so the first, the second one, I think we have talked about yeah. a little bit. So maybe the, the first one. So, so, um, so there was a lot of talk, and you know, even you know, way before the pandemic about onshoring, and there were people talked about the the uh, kind of leveling out of, of productivity improvements in, in container transportation, and so all those. So, so there were a lot of incentives to to, to move back um, home, and and of course the uh, the widespread use of robots and so on. So all that suggested that you know, we're going to uh, move more things more and more towards um, closer to to, to uh, or, or move them back home. In particular, this was you know, very important in the US and, and to some extent in Europe. So when you look at the actual investment now, you don't see much of that. And actually, you know, those who follow China, you, you know, we have you know record levels of FDI. And, you know, China is, is uh, you know receiving more FDI than it you know, basically ever, than it ever did. And, and that, uh, I think, reflects, you know, to some extent, maybe there are some onshoring by Chinese uh, uh, companies in, in, that, uh, in those numbers. But I think it also suggests that the kind of cost drivers, the efficiency drivers that have been so important for these patterns to emerge are still in favor of not having the onshore. And, and the specific arguments have been used, you know, that somehow the pandemic and the fact that you, if you move closer home, you have more control over um, things and, and, and you, know, you can maybe, um, yeah, you, you can plan better. But think about it, you know, you move into uh, any states, you, you are now a company based in the US with a lot of production in Asia and you move it home. Does it really mean that you have more control? I mean, given what's going on in the US, it's not, it's not clear that, that uh, your ability to secure deliveries and, and, and the impact of the pandemic is better there. And, and so I'm not saying onshoring is, is gone. I think it, it, that it has to be, if you think long-term about uh, the net zero, you know, we have to move things closer to, to where we consume them, we produce them closer to where we consume them uh, you know, at some point because we, we, we need to get away from transporting things so far. But I think that, that impact we haven't seen very much yet. And, and I think that was not what people had in mind when they talked about onshoring before. Uh, so, so maybe that will, onshoring will come, I suggest, in the future, you know, once, but, but driven by the net zero transition, not by these um, factors of, of, of you know, robotization. Because you know, China is doing robotization much more quickly, actually, than the, the US is. So, so, I think but, but maybe another factor, if I can just follow yeah. up on that question, is of course geopolitics. Yeah. No, no. I, I mean, with yeah. the pandemic, you had yeah. countries discussing mm -hmm. we should produce our own vaccines. Yeah. Yeah. We also have different mm -hmm. types mm -hmm. of conflicts now yeah. that may affect how you think about these. Yeah. No, no, so no, absolutely. no, absolutely. So, so I'm not denying that this has. A... In terms of the pandemic, we're also getting. You know, access to key to vaccines or to protective equipment and so on. Um, it's not obvious that you you get. I mean, first of all, that, that's happened, right? So, U.S. didn't export any of its vaccines and and, and uh, for a long time, and, and now it's, it's doing it. But you know, that's so that didn't change very much. But uh, if you if you look. Uh, I mean, there will be areas where these, I, I think, I think it's going to happen mostly in high tech. We are worried about, uh, you know, uh, intellectual property rights uh, going away or you having opportunities for illicit, you know, activities, spying and so on. I think that control over, over value chains in that sense could, could uh, happen. You know, I think it's already happening in some, um, in some ways because actually both in the US and in China so that, you know, the, one very striking thing is if you 
a lot of the data we used for um, when we did the report and looked at the impact of the pandemic on global value chains was based on high frequency data from container transport. And actually, since some a few months, China stopped reporting. Uh, they have turned on off the uh, uh, whatever transponders, whatever they have on, on the boats to, to, so you can no longer see where they are. This was a very important um, part of the information that was used uh, for logistics. You know, you knew how, where a particular ship was and, and when it would arrive, and you could plan your logistics from that. But because China is so reluctant to share this type of information, it's decided not to participate in this uh, global information sharing. And you have a lot of that happening in the US. So, so this could be, of course, influence global value chains in the future. All right. I'll have two questions from the floor here. We'll collect them. Yes, please. Hi, Eric. Hi. Um, so you, you say that um, you think firms should be covered by the U.S. What would it for when uh, Europe introduces a carbon work tax to yeah. uh, force all firms and, and, and what does it mean for, let's say, the English firms to struggle to pull against it? Now, so this uh, border adjustment tax, so for those who don't follow this, you know, it's about basically making sure that you know, when we are raising carbon prices and when we are posing costs to, to uh, achieve net zero transition within Europe, we don't want uh, others to sort of benefit from that and become more competitive. Or, some of our activities moving out and to avoid uh, these uh, carbon taxes or carbon prices in Europe. And, and I can tell you that this is a big worry all over Asia. And, and in China, to some extent, but China you know, is so powerful and so strong in the global economy, it's not their main concern, but uh, in many other countries, are really concerned about this. And, and I think the way it has to be, I think it's unavoidable. I mean, it's You'll have have something like that, uh, but how you introduce it, how you um, combine it with other efforts to support countries that become hit by this is going to be incredibly important. But this is a, a big, big thing, uh, and, and uh, it could turn into a you know, major protectionist tool. But uh, I think it has to be applied with some with a lot of caution. Did I see someone else? Yes. Yeah. Maybe I can ask you to introduce yourself. Sorry for the audience that's not in here. Hi, my name is Jonathan Mele, I'm an researcher at SITE. Um, you talked at the start of the presentation about the role of stimulus packages mm -hmm. in explaining the current strain mm -hmm. on the on global supply chains. And I was wondering to what extent you consider that avoidable through better coordination or through different kinds of stimulus. Or is it the case that every global crisis will be the recovery will always be hampered by the fact that supply chains don't have the capacity to accommodate the stimulus? Thank you. I think that's a very good question. I had the pleasure to work several years with Johnson, so I, I knew that he can ask very good questions. So, so, so uh, I think the the, um, the I, I certainly what what I take away from this crisis that we need to understand this much better. And, and I'm not saying that we necessarily would have done things differently because we knew that whatever we did now, it was very poorly targeted. You know, I, I think that's going to be a big lesson taken away from, from this experience. And that, you know, particularly the US, I think, will have to do something about, you know, also how you target, you know, individuals, for example, you know, my, you know, people everywhere around the world who were. U.S. had some uh, U.S. residency received in a check in the mail, and it you know, didn't make any sense. And so, so yes, we have to learn from this, and it applies also in this area. I think the I, I struggle a bit right now to think about how you would do it because it, it's exactly this demand effect that you want from, from these measures, and and. We haven't spoken about it now, but it, you know, it's, if you look around the world now, and particularly you know, the world, in emerging and developing countries, you know, the big thing that comes out of this crisis is, is the fact that you know, we will have almost no scars in, in advanced countries, almost no impact on the long-term growth uh, path. And, but for 
least for the foreseeable future, emerging developing countries will grow more slowly than, than uh, advanced. And, and we haven't seen that for many decades, or basically never. And, and uh, so that's, and, and when you think about this, the kind of things that are not even measured now, like impact on education, for example, you know, the fact that you, you know, you have many years of potentially lost schooling and in, in, in countries, this could be, you know, very major impacts. And, and of course, if you go from emerging to developing and less developed countries, the scoring is, is even worse. And, and they, you know, they have, and, and it's only begun. You know, they are now facing, after trying to do some fiscal stimulus and, you know, even some countries managed to do sort of um, innovative um, monetary policies and so on. You know, they exhausted their, all their buffers. They're now facing, you know, and now they have very poor vaccination coverage. You know, not everyone, but many of the countries have, and particularly in the less developed countries. So, you know, they're going to face new waves of new variants of this virus. and with almost no protection in place. So, so I mean, we have to think much more carefully about how, you know, because there will be more pandemics. I think we, we, we have to prepare ourselves that we are, going to li we are living in an age of pandemics uh, and uh, you know, it's just a matter of time. And, and if we cannot have a better way of responding and more targeted and, and in a more inclusive way of responding in the future, it's going to, you know, this is going to be very, you know, we're going to have a lot of, issues in terms of also the perception of, of what's happening in the world now among emerging and developing countries is, is very negative. And, and this trust in the global institutions are, I have never seen it so low. I and mean, I see it now, for example, there have been some very creative and, and I think important reforms uh, proposed in terms of how we prepare ourselves for future pandemics, how we respond to future pandemics. And, and um, basically the emerging economies are not standing up behind this because they, they no longer trust the institutions that are supposed to do this. So, so um, you know, how are we going to restore that trust is going to be you know, a huge issue for, for the global community. So I'm going to come back with two questions from our online audience. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions that are about environment and mm -hmm. climate. Mm -hmm. uh, so one is about uh, infrastructure development mm -hmm. as such. Uh, the environmental impact such developments can have and, and how you think about that, uh, what sort of environmental policies or issues should be there to, to deal with sort of the global value chain issues. And, and the other one is then related to, to how, how we deal with sort of a development strategy based on, on global value chains and, you know, climate change or sort of the net zero transition, if you want. Mm -hmm. So, so what do you mean? Uh, the second part of it, for, so is it how development? Yeah, so I mean, if, 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 if you have uh, sort of getting integrated into global value chain as your development strategy, mm -hmm. before we are at the stage of, of net zero sort of energy, mm -hmm. how that may then impact climate, I guess. So the first question was about um, how... Environmental, then yeah, more the yeah, local yeah, version. So, 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 uh, yeah. So I, I work for a, a development bank that you know thinks of itself as very green oriented and and, and that always looking for for sort of green ways of, of, of doing and uh, things and then particularly looking structure development and, and making sure that we are you know in all ways trying to avoid the kind of mistakes that were made in the past, but. You know, it's, it's one thing to, to look at the downside. Uh, it's a much more ambitious thing to try to look at, you know, how can we use infrastructure to improve uh, environment and how can we, um, uh, you know, and, and, and for example, here also, how can we use infrastructure investment to affect global value chains and, and then, you know, look for how global value chains can help to improve uh, uh, you know, or, or reduced uh, carbonization and maybe even contribute to, I mentioned biodiversity here, which is something that, you know, that's a new frontier. And, and, and we're going to look much more about at what com companies do and what countries do when it comes to, to biodiversity. So I think this is, you have to have an integrated approach. You have to have to look at these things, you know, in, 
in the same kind of framework. And, and uh, you know, whether you know, we don't have the same powerful tools yet when it comes to biodiversity and other areas, there's something called One Health, which also is a lot of emphasis on at the moment. We don't have the same agreement on what metrics to use. We don't have the carbon footprint or, and, and so on. But we, I think we have these measures have to start becoming integrated uh, as part of you know, how we assess development efforts. And, and uh, so and, uh, as, to, me, to, to me, this is, uh, it's already happening. You know, partly because for fiscal reasons, you know, more and more governments are shifting from aid policies to climate policies. It's happening in this country, it's happening, you know, in, in many other countries. So development policy is already trying to look at these things in an integrated way and then trying to use maybe the, the climate motive and the net zero transition as a way to explain, you know, why we should give money to uh, developing uh, countries. And so, so I'm, I'm not sure it answered uh, exactly the question, but it, it sort of uh, suggests that, you know, this is no longer separate things. You know, we need to think about uh, the impact we're having on, on, you know, both in terms of uh, immediate impact from the specific investment, but then more long-term, you know, what development do we cause by making these investments? So the, this is, um, yeah. And, I just want to pick up one word you use. Yeah. We have to make sure or something along yeah, those yeah, lines. Yeah. And and that raises, of course, the question. We we don't really have the global multilateral institutions to make sure that all of these investments mm -hmm. are sort of environmentally friendly or yeah. sort of contributing to the green transition. Do you think we need to reinforce some of the existing institutions or are we already on, on the way there with, with World Bank and other banks? So, so I'm following a number of these international processes now and, and the outcome of almost every single process. And so take this, uh, what I mentioned, uh, you know, pandemic response. One of the main recommendations of this high level panel that was uh, put in place or, or, or uh, authorized by the G20 was the MDBs, the multilateral developments, had to play a much more important role. And um, you, you look at Glasgow, the same thing. The MDBs had to play a more important role. They will be playing a more important role, but I don't think they're really, unfortunately, probably not going to be the answer to your question. They, they, and, and for a number of reasons. One is that, you know, some of them, it's not the case of AIB, but some of these uh, institutions are becoming capital constrained. And so they don't have, uh, a lot of additional capacity to, to um, invest. And, and um, they also, I mean, the scale of, of the challenge we are facing and the amount of investment we need, I mean, the best we can hope for is that they will become kind of a catalyst of private sector funding. And that I think is the future. Thing. And, and Marcus is an expert on this, but, but uh, you know, we, we, I think that's where we have to look at how can we use these institutions to get the private sector involved and how it's not going to be about their own capital it's going to be about uh, using you know in part the verification capacity because somehow there is something uh, about um, these multilateral institutions that they are not as easily manipulated maybe as some national institutions and even china now by the way so we we are working with one of the major policy banks in china we don't do iab doesn't do a lot of things in china but we are actually working with one of the policy banks now too because they want to have and so revise their what they call esd framework the environmental social and governance framework and they want to use us as to verify that they are actually doing what they're saying so that this could be an important role for for the MDBs to, to make sure that, you know, whatever claims, for example, a, a DVC firms making about, you know, the improvements that they have made, you know, there could be a role for, for us in, in verifying that. And, you know, a lot of this is about what we call traceability, the ability to trace the origin of, of components and, and what went into producing them and so on. That could be a role for MDBs to, to verify that traceability or maybe even uh, lead that, uh, Trace, uh, trace so, so do you see a future where we have more 
extensive carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Place, yeah, I, I, I think we, it's going to be unavoidable. It's, it, it's just uh, it is unacceptable for countries to to see you know much increased costs for production because we need to make all these adjustments inside the country and 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 companies just moving out activities because they become more competitive by not being in the country. So it is very hard to see how, how we can go forward without something like that. But, but I mentioned all the downsides, so we, we have to see how we deal with that. But uh, again, you need you need this somehow at the global level to regulate this. And whether we can do that, I think it's, a, it's a very much an open issue. So a much more specific question here from online. What is your advice to say a big global shipping company invest in new ships or something yeah. else? So, so that's very interesting because um, so some of the shipping companies, and actually I was this morning on a very interesting webinar that um, called the Race to Net Zero, and it was a US, American, and Chinese collaboration. And um, the, sh the shipping companies there, uh, kind of industry organization, were presenting themselves. And you know, a lot is happening. Really remarkable. Maersk is, is one of the real, you know, the, the Danish uh, companies. It's, uh, it's amazing what they're doing. And they are now actually investing in, in and they are committing to net zero. And they have just ordered a, a, a whole new generation of, of ships that are basically net zero. And, and, uh, and, and that is going to be, I, I think, that's going to be a really important element of it. So if if the shipping industry can go net zero, that changes a lot of things. And, and, and we talked about this onshoring and so on. But uh, you know, if, if they can really both uh, keep uh, go net zero and keeping costs down, and then you know, a lot of the investments they are making now are actually in long term going to be cost saving. You know, if, if you can really ship across the world at net zero, it, it's uh, you know you can generate your own energy. I mean, this is. Uh, what these new ships do. I mean, they have solar and, and, and you know, wind and everything. And this, you know, they use sails to, to, to um, and apparently just uh, using sails can save something like 30% of the carbon footprint. And so that's, uh, you know, so much going on in that space. Very, very exciting. I mean, do you see any potential issues? I mean, if you have to replace uh, big shipping fleets, you, mm -hmm. you will also, I guess, need new minerals or other yeah. materials that go into that process. It, mm. That's not going to be a net zero, I guess, no. at some no. end, right? No, so that is, that's going to be, you know, so that's one area you have the battery production, you know, some you know, very specific uh, metals or, or materials that will be, have to be used. So it's, you know, the, of course, the focus now on net zero is on, on, uh, the carbon footprint, but you know we need to think much more generally about our footprint, you know, in terms of, of planetary health. So you know that's the next level. Biodiversity is part of that, but it's, of course it's broader. It's about be becoming sustainable with you know, with a long term future. So yes, we will have to. We will see those effects, and we I don't think we can fully understand them yet but you can see that for example you know like a country like the, the drc you know in, in, you know as the interest in the drc right now i've never seen it as as, as great it's because that they have rich deposits in in, in some of these um, mat uh, materials of these yeah. definitely going to be part of the story we also have another question from online here which is about uh, mounting pressures that that ethics and human rights should mm. be integral in, in doing the infrastructure development uh, mm. uh, etc uh, how do you think about these issues is it no, asking I, too much of, of that no i i think you know again it's a part of sustainability right it's part of est is it's just uh, the social component is important and, and the g is also important you, you have to do a lot of consultations when you do these kind of complex infrastructure projects. So, and, and to me, that's the most interesting part about infrastructure is that you know every infrastructure project is like so <coughs> embedded in a social context. And the only when you understand that context do you understand can you understand the impact these 
project would have. And, and you know, it, what I'm trying to build now at, at this bank is, is about us being much more granular, much more, uh, you know, have much greater capacity to assess this impact. And, and that goes from everything from, you know, impact on, on uh, indigenous communities, uh, uh, impact on, on biodiversity, impact on, on uh, you know, sonoric diseases, whatever it is, you know, we need to have much better tools to understand. It. And, and uh, human rights is, 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 is part of this. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, if we cannot, uh, I, I think we, you know, the problem with human rights agenda is that, that it's sort of, there's no real agreement among, across countries and, and, you know, what, what are human rights? But I think on this, at this level, in terms of, you know, if you are being affected by infrastructure investment, you should receive compensation that is fair. And you know, if you are displaced, you, there has to be, you know, a process and, and so on. Those, those type of human rights, I think there's agreement. I think there are obviously other aspects of human rights that would be much more difficult to, to integrate into, but, but we, we should think about it. Looking out at the audience here, yes, yeah. please. Uh, well, I am a PhD student here in Stockholm School of the Economics, yeah. and I'm very interested in sustainability in global supply chain, mm -hmm. particularly in India and Bangladesh. Yeah. And I see that you mentioned India a lot, and yeah. I see that the even the government, the global supply chain participation of India is actually rather mm -hmm. dropping yeah. after. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can uh, say a little bit more about that. What makes a country's lower expense in the global value? So, first of all, so as I said before, one has to be a bit careful because in that period, uh, global trade increased. So, it may be that the absolute amounts, maybe uh, there's as much participation uh, uh, in the global value chains in India. So, I don't have a very good. Um, explanation other than what I showed here that you know, it's very much concentrated on individual, a few states, four or five states, that's where all the action is. And so to understand what's happened, you have to understand in part what's ha what happened in those states. And then you have some things that happen here, you know, the monetization uh, or re uh, uh, valuation of the, of the, um, the currency. A lot of things happen in the, in the Indian economy that may have affected uh, these um, these this participation. I think Bangladesh is super interesting because it has really managed to engage in global value chains in a way that almost no other country has done in terms of increasing its participation and and you are doing it through textiles and and you can very interesting to do the comparison between Pakistan and Bangladesh. There used to be a sort of, and even India and in Bangladesh that there used to be a sort of the same level in terms of uh, engagement in in, in uh, in textiles and so on, but Bangladesh has really managed incredibly powerfully to, to move up in the value chain and, and move closer to, to final goals. And, and, and that, I think, is a big part of the Bangladeshi overall economic success, which is, which is remarkable. So, so and, and it's happened sort of in a way that it's very surprising. So, I, you know, we, we do a lot of investments in Bangladesh, but it's almost, it's very difficult because the authorities are very slow in responding and it takes forever to get uh, you know, uh, projects really started and, and completed and so on. So somehow that part of government doesn't work very well, but what's happening in, in, in the kind of garments and, and, and so on is, is, is truly uh, exemplary. And, and we need to spend a lot of time understanding you know, what happened in Bangladesh as a sort of development model, both what happened in government, what happened you know, through financial outreach, you know, the Grameen Bank and all that, uh, around mobiles and mobile phones and so on. That is, uh, you know, a very interesting as a lesson, important lesson for, for development. Maybe just quickly getting back to sort of, you mentioned that the global value chain, the firms involved in these processes would take the lead in making the transformation to net zero what what do you see as their main incentives is it because 
regulators are going to tell them? Is it because Micro's pension fund is not going to invest in them? Or is it the consumers that are not buying their goods? What do you think is really driving them? Not just the no, I think all, all of the above. <laughs> all of no, 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 but I, I really think so. I mean, the, these companies are now making these uh, commitments. Uh, you know, it's extraordinary what's happened in the last uh, few years in terms of companies saying, and you know, we have to be a little bit skeptical about their ability to to uh, to achieve all these uh, or reach those uh, goals that I've set up. But you know, you have. Consumers being more concerned about this. You have shareholders being more concerned about this. You have civil society organizations being more concerned about this. And very importantly, uh, and, and increasingly important, is going to be your financial, your creditors. And, and, you know, the, and uh, if you are going to, if you are in financial institution, or you, have, you have to start thinking very carefully about your, your climate exposure. And, or you exposed in sectors that are going to have a lot of stranded assets and so on. And that, that is going to be a very important pressure, I think. And, and, and many of these companies are anticipating uh, this, and, and that's why they're making this commitment. And that, in turn, you know, for, for them to reach these, commit, these levels of, 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 or, or these um, uh, net zero, whether it's happening in 2040 or 2050 or 2060 in some cases, but to reach that, they will need to have offsets. I mean, they, I think there's no way that all these companies in all these sectors are going to be able to reach without having offsets. So that creates whole new markets for you know, uh, private uh, offsets and, and you, uh, companies that can move quicker have strong incentives to move quicker because they can off sell offsets to companies that will not be able to reach those targets and so on. So I think that is driving our whole new uh, development and, and uh, uh, I just spent some time uh, on an exercise to, together with um, some international economists and, and Chinese economists to look at China's own net zero transition and, and they have you know, just started the emission trading system uh, in China and it's not going very well. I mean, it's you know, the, the, the price is about 100 yuan. I mean, Europe now is close to 100 euros, so it's you know, it's but. 10 times higher yeah. in, in Europe. And, and um, that, uh, you know, that uh, just having the emission trading, not having uh, any private uh, offset market is going to be, China will need to do this. And, and every country will somehow have to engage in, in carbon offsets because if we are going to allow, if companies are going to be able to meet these commitments, it's very, very interesting. I mean, one, one very related and, and maybe final question to you is that some of the discussion back here has been, you know, as an investor, should you keep your investments in the companies that are not all the way net zero today? Or should you stay with even an oil producer because you are push, putting pressure on them to become net zero at some stage? I mean, how, yeah. how should we think about that? As, as if I'm putting my... Pension money yeah. somewhere. Should I uh, this is, uh, only should, do the green? I, I want to hear what Marcus says. Yeah. This, but, 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 you know, just a very quick comment is we, we talk about sort of green finance, and there's a lot to say about that. You know, you know very little of this is sort of additional finance, actually, but or, or additional in the sense that it really changed what, what companies are doing. But um, the, uh, the, the real, if we can, really have an impact is what we call transition finance. So you, if you can start thinking about the incremental impact you have on a company and somehow get um, investors to agree to finance, you know, to, to um, invest because you are moving very quickly towards let's say or your impact you're having uh, in terms of your carbon the total carbon footprint of the, of the world, so say, you know, if you can solve that issue, I mean, if you can find ways of, of, um, of really um, making this uh, verifiable and, and agreed to standards and so on, that's a, a huge market, a huge opportunity. And, and uh, I know that a lot of the banks here, for example, are thinking about that. How can we 
go from sort of climate bonds to transition bonds, for example. And, and, and um, if we can if we can find ways of agreeing on this, uh, that can change um, a lot of things. But but this is and this is particularly important in emerging and developing countries where it's much more likely that green finance will be truly additional in those countries, you know, in the sense that what I mean is that, you know, a lot, and I remember when we started, you know, a long time ago at EBRD to do issue climate bonds, it was all about just redefining how, you know, assets, you know, these products we would have made anyhow. We would just uh, say that now we call this a green finance. And, and, and then the markets bought that, and they, that's how much of this is happening still. But um, the real opportunity here is, is if we can get, make sure that this is really, because we have this access to these green climate bonds, for example, companies are going to change what they do. And, and, and that is, we are far away from this. I think the estimates now are that two to three, maybe 5% of all the climate finance, which is very significant now, is additional. And, and that's a kind of- So some work left to do there. Some work left to do. All right, on this note, I would like to thank Gary. Big round of applause. Welcome you back on your next trip to Stockholm. So, it might be sooner than you think. So, you should yeah. probably. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone online. And we're closing this session here today. And Merry Christmas to everyone. And get back and join us for new discussions in the new year. So, thank you. Thank you.